hello everybody. Uh, I'm Ashu Gupta uh, and uh, I would be taking you to uh, through the follow up session today. Uh, the last session was uh, uh, hosted by Arul, Arul Jain and he uh, briefly touched upon all the topics and gave the introduction to functional safety and, and then went on into the details of uh, the, the safety architecture and its implementation in the hardware. What are the things that are taken care in the, the hardware design and all that? Uh, I will uh, I, I will you know take a follow up session and you know try to connect it uh, from where he left. Uh, I will talk about the functional safety architecture in general, the safety concepts, and uh, you know how the the silicon is developed, the MCUs and PUs are developed. What are the different aspects which are supposed to be taken care? Uh, why some safety mechanisms are there? Why safety is important uh, in the life cycle of the silicon? Where what safety mechanisms uh, would be provided, and what what is it that could be expected from the integration environment? What is it that could be uh, uh, you know expected from the software? So I have a you know uh, very rich experience in the software. I'm basically so from the embedded software uh, development background, but then you know seven eight years back when I moved into the functional safety, and now I'm I am involved in the functional safety uh, architecture. So that's how I can you know I will be able to take you to the through uh, what is done in the safety architecture. Uh, in typically when uh, what we do in the uh, expect from the safety architecture specifically for the software uh, that is expected by you know the the chip manufacturers uh, yeah so brief introduction on why why functional safety so uh, functional safety basically the some disturbance here. Uh, everybody can please go on mute. There's some. Yeah, thanks. OK, so while I go through the slides, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, interrupt me uh, anytime during the presentation. Let this uh, uh, it be more uh, interactive. Uh, so anytime you have your questions, please do interrupt me. Uh, and ask your questions so you know so that it is really uh, beneficial for uh, for everybody here it's worth spending the time for people okay so uh, functional safety is basically the absence of unreasonable risk due to the hazards caused by malfunctioning behavior of electric and electronic systems so uh, you know now these days uh, you know in the in the car in the automobiles typically the the amount of uh, electronics uh, parts has increased so much and uh, because of such uh, increase in the complexity more and more electronic parts in the cars and then more and more software running uh, in 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 that uh, this both there could be bugs in the software and there could be, you know, the, the faults in the hardware. Uh, so because of that, uh, the electronic parts typically could misbehave. They could behave, uh, uh, you know, not as per the specifications. So when due to these faults, there, there is a malfunctioning, it causes some hazards and these hazards, uh, you know, exposes uh, people who are uh, you know, in the car to the risks, risk of life uh, or risk of, uh, you know, some severe injuries due to the accidents. So the functional safety, the purpose of all that we are doing uh, to, to for the functional safety, uh, be it in our processes, be it in our architecture, everything is just to reduce the risk to the extent that, you know, uh, the risk that is left is not really so unreasonable, so it is not really life threatening or it does not exposes it expose the people to, you know, very, very severe injuries. So that is the basic purpose of all all that we do for functional safety. So that is the basic purpose for having 
such standards of functional safety, be it ISO 26262 for um, you know automotive or IEC 61508 for the industrial applications. So basically, it is uh, you know to to reduce the risks which is which ex, which is exposed to people because of the malfunctioning of uh, electrical and electronic parts. So uh, more and more you demonstrate the freedom from negligence, more and more you reduce the 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 liability. So as you keep going up in the functional safety that you provide in uh, into your systems, uh, the the matter of liability reduces. So that's how we just show the the weight of functional safety into our systems. Okay, so this is what I am going to cover today. So uh, we will talk about the functional safety for the semiconductor companies. So semiconductor companies are giving the basically their MCUs and MPUs on which the customer applications are running. OK, the, the safety applications are running. So the multiple uh, electronic control units in the cars, basically, you know, be it airbag, the power windows, the sunroof, braking system, cruise control. So everything runs on the 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 controllers that uh, semiconductor companies are providing, right? So then what does it mean uh, for the semiconductor companies that what do they need to provide from their side to ensure safety of such applications? So this is what we will cover. And then the below topics, safe acquisition, computation, interconnect, communication, infrastructure, and all, all these topics are basically the, the different functions that uh, where the safety would be, yeah, would have to be taken care, which would, these things would have to be uh, considered when the, the silicon is providing uh, the support for functional safety. So I we will go over all these topics uh, one by one. So just, just let us start right away. So, uh, so SOC, SOC system on chip, it provides the uh, safe hardware for the applications to run. Uh, now, if I consider this safe hardware uh, for the for the automotive, uh, basically it, this is this is used in the ECUs in the cars, and on this ECUs, all the applications run, which provide you uh, with the features that we have in car. So these are you know comfort features like um, you know, the, the windows or the sunroof and many other uh, body control applications or it could be very critical applications like uh, you know braking, uh, anti-lock braking system uh, or you know uh, non-safety related applications also like infotainment and uh, all those things. So. Uh, the, the sim semiconductor companies basically provide uh, uh, the, the silicon for all, all such applications. Uh, so uh, when semiconductor companies provide uh, the hardware, what they have to ensure, basically what they have to ensure is that the fault in the underlying hardware do not become the reason for applications to behave uh, that the application safety goals are violated. Now it depends on the applications. Uh, what are their safety goals, right? So, uh, for example, if it is a Windows, so you are trying to open or close the window, and you know there is a there is a baby sitting there, there is a small child sitting there, and it puts the hands there. So there should be it, it should not really uh, you know harm the child. So th this could be the the kind of. Uh, uh, application or it could be you know another application like uh, when I am applying the brake or, uh, or when I am applying the acceleration in the car, uh, the acceleration should not go beyond what is expected or intended. Similarly, the braking has to reduce the speed of the car and you know how it has to reduce the speed of the car. So depending on uh, different applications, the, uh, the, the, the safety mechanisms basically have to be provided by the, the semiconductor vendor that whatever is the application, its safety goals should not get violated. 
and you know the silicon has to consider all such applications which could be running on the on the microcontroller or microprocessor that they provide so uh what silicon vendors will do they will provide the safety mechanisms uh that will uh, enable or it facilitates the application to fulfill their safety goals so depending on whichever application is running they will have you know different kind of safety requirements they will have different kind of safety concept but ultimately everybody will need some basic things you know which will boil down to uh, safe actuation safe uh, compute safe storage safe communication safe actuation safe infrastructure so all these things are basic which has to be there for running a safety application so uh, when the silicon vendors uh, will provide will you know they are they are doing the safety concepts they will analyze these use cases uh, you know in which uh, typically the soc would be used and based on that you know they will generalize it and based on that they will provide the safety mechanisms that uh, you know uh, we provide all such things uh, which uh, which make sure that uh, uh, we are covering or we are facilitating the safety applications that have to run and make sure that the safety their safety goals do not get violated whatever they are expecting from the underlying hardware or for the underlying uh, ecosystem uh, we are either providing it in the hardware or we are telling them how to use the hardware uh, how to use the silicon uh, you know uh, so that your safety goals will not be violated or we provide some software uh, through which we provide uh, you know all such things uh, so many a things can be provided also by the software uh, and through that the silicon vendors can still claim that i am enabling uh, you know your safety goods though by not hardware by while i am selling just the hardware but i am supporting you by some software or i am telling you what you should do in your software to make sure that uh, the your safety goals are not violated uh, so this is the focus of the semiconductor uh, vendors who are uh, basically selling their uh, socs in the market and uh, the, the the car manufacturers are basically buying that to have the issues on that So uh, let us quickly go through uh, what ex exactly each of these mean. Uh, safe actuation, uh, safe acquisition. Uh, so what is the purpose of acquisition? If you see a typical system uh, in any system actually in the car, which is uh, at very high level is same, right? It acquires data. It acquires the data which is coming from the sensors. Now the sensors could be detecting completely different thing depending on the application. It could be detecting an accelerator or brake pedal press. It could be uh, detecting the, the windows open or close button, seat adjustment settings or something, but everything is actually uh, getting detected through sensors and then sensors give that data to the inputs of the, the SOC of your microcontroller. So now first thing is that we have to acquire this data safely. There are a lot of things which are outside the scope of the SOC, which is responsible for doing the safe ac acquisition. Uh, so definitely the silicon vendors, uh, you know, proposes such things that what should be done outside my scope, how should the data be acquired uh, to ensure safety. And then, then they, they do the things that is required in the, the scope of the silicon, what can be done in the silicon design. So this is the safe acquisition, basically. Um, collecting first the right data, because if you collect the data, your input data itself is wrong, then you know whatever else you do, you, you, it, it will not serve the purpose. Uh, so safe acquisition is about acquiring the data correctly, safely. A uh, safe actuation is then finally giving the output. You know, you acquire the data, you do whatever with the data, and after that, you have to basically give an output. 
uh, which is uh, you know used to take decisions uh, in the car, which actually takes the required actions in the car. So this is, for example, giving output to the engine control, uh, or you know about the change in car speed, or it's any setting which gets actually changed is because of the output that uh, you know that is produced as a result of uh, your computation. So that is safe actuation. Uh, then the safe compute and safe storage. Uh, basically, safe compute is uh, something that is uh, which with which you really do uh, with the brain of the uh, the SOC, which is the core on which you do the computation. Okay, so. Um, now the date, the computation definitely has to be done correctly. If you are wrong with your basic computation, then again the system cannot work because you produce the wrong results. If you produce the wrong results, then you know your the output that you produce for the actuation will definitely be wrong. Right. So the, another very important aspect where the safety has to be considered. Then the safe storage. Uh, the storage is where your your code that you are executing or the data which you need to store uh, is there. So again, if your data gets corrupted, your code gets corrupted. So you are executing, uh, you know, a wrong code or you are working with the wrong data that you are storing in your memory. So again, uh, it will definitely have an impact. You know, you, your computation works correctly, but if you are working on wrong data or you are just uh, you know, doing a wrong computation because your code itself is corrupted, then you cannot do much. So safety has to be considered definitely in your storage part. Uh, then these lines that you see, this is uh, the interconnect because in the silicon everything is getting uh, connected you know things are there is a data flow or the control flow happening between the different parts of the silicon uh, so this is the say the interconnect again when the, the the control or data flow happens between the different ingredients in your silicon that also has to uh, be safe because if it gets corrupted uh, then again you know ultimately you are working with the uh, uh, wrong inputs or you are producing wrong outputs. So your interconnect has to be considered uh, uh, for the safety. Uh, the, the next thing is uh, safe communication. So uh, basically the concept for the, the interconnect and communication is more or less same, but the interconnect is within the SOC. So typically it is taken care much better by the silicon safety concept because it is within within the boundary of the SOC. You know, the internal SOC components are connected and communicating through the safe interconnect. So SOC has more control on it and uh, they typically take care of it in the uh, in their hardware uh, concept. Uh, they take care more on the safe interconnect. Uh, whereas the safe communication is about the communication external to the silicon. So um, here, uh, you know, you can you can. Provide some mechanisms in the hardware, but then you also give lots of assumptions and lot of expectations on the software uh, to to basically provide the safe communication. So uh, if you see in the car, there are there's so much of electronics. So um, uh, the things are not, you know, the your basic function is not taken care by a single SOC. There will be so many SOCs. So they typically have to communicate with each other to fulfill the, the main application needs, right? So when they communicate with each other, it it typically becomes uh, comes in the scope of the overall safety uh, concept of a particular function, right? Like if you say anti-lock braking system or the body control functions or whichever, so they uh, they communicate with each other, and when they are they are sending some data or they are receiving some data, if the data gets corrupted on the way, again that is a problem. So you know we have to have this included in our concept that. Uh, you know, we provide uh, uh, the safe communication 
and how to provide that? Yeah, there are different ways, but uh, the, the safety during the communication needs to be taken care. Uh, and uh, last but not the least is the same a safe infrastructure because you know all the things that we have talked about uh, uh, you know they work with the, the power that uh, the soc works on on which soc works on and the clock so if our power and clock are you know, not protected then it will affect everything on the silicon so you know we do need the safe infrastructure uh, for running the safety applications So when we talk about now safety in all these aspects, so how what, how is it that we take care of safety in all the all the all these aspects? So basically, we we provide safety mechanisms uh, in different parts of the silicon for the different functions. Uh, so safety mechanisms ensure that you know the safety is guaranteed so how safety is guaranteed be it by detection or by prevention the safety is guaranteed so these uh, safety mechanisms are implemented either in the hardware of the soc so there are lots of things which are provided in the hardware it could be implemented by the software running on the course of the soc or it gets implemented by the integration environment of the soc OK, so, you know, when we say that this SOC has to be integrated in the ECU, uh, we put different kinds of assumptions on the integration environment and we tell that this must be done this way or that way. So that those are the assumptions on the integration environment and this is how the safety mechanisms get implemented. So uh, typically, uh, you know, a mixed approach is used. Uh, depending on where the silicon is used, the, the, its its use cases, uh, you know, it can be decided that uh, where what safety mechanism makes sense, where it is more efficient, where should we do this? So more can be given in the hardware, more must be given in the hardware, or in some cases, you know, we can have the hardware bare minimum, very basic, and uh, more can be done by the software. Uh, so such use cases are to be considered, you know, uh, the more and more you want, a, a, you know, very less support from the hardware, more bulky your silicon will be because you will have to have all the safety mechanism uh, implemented on the chip and that means a lot more hardware, right? A lot more redundancy. So about the space that the silicon will use will be more. Uh, the power consumption will be more. So uh, now th this a rational approach has to be taken on what is that we have to have in silicon. So for this use case, we cannot have the software overheads and we have to give more in silicon, whereas you know what other things we can definitely have in the software and it is OK. Uh, so such uh, such things are, uh, you know, this analysis is typically done during the safety concept. And uh, you know what is being seen is that you know earlier we we had more and more in the hardware, but the role of software is significantly increasing, and you know it has many benefits. It reduces the load on how much uh, hardware can provide or it must provide. Uh, it reduces the hardware complexity, so, so it just reduces the die size. OK, and uh, it uh, helps in the deployment of uh, in the ECU power consumption. So space in the chip is, uh, you know, very, very critical. Uh, so if the space on the chip, uh, you know, by reduced hardware reduces, it reduces the power consumption. So that is how, you know, the software based mechanisms become if, if they don't put, put uh, you know, unreasonable amount of overheads on the application. So, so such software based uh, things can become uh, very uh, useful basically uh, in in uh, implementing the in having the safety concept done for the silicon. Uh, it also reduces the development time of the silicon and thus the time to market for the product because you know with the software it makes it more flexible. Things can be added later. Also, so you know, we reduce the scope on what we provide uh, in the silicon uh, helps 
helps reduce the burden on the hardware. It reduces the die size. It reduces the power consumption, and it also, uh, you know, uh, reduces the time to market. It reduces the development time for the silicon, so you are able to go into the market earlier. And the flexibility, of course, is uh, increased in the overall implementation of the safety concept because uh, you know there are some things which you, which you can enhance, improve in the software even later. So this this is this is the value add that uh, comes by bringing more in the, the scope of software. So. Here we talk about the different methods that are used for the safe acquisition. So now in the SOC, the data always comes from the sensors. So when we are acquiring data from the sensors, what are the different things which can go wrong? Right. So when we are acquiring the data, the sensor itself could be faulty. OK, so it is giving the wrong input. Uh, so the data sensor could be all right, but the the connection of the sensor to the SOC, there could be a problem there. OK, so this line, there could be a fault. Sensor, there could be a fault. Or there could be a fault in the peripheral, uh, which is uh, acquiring basically the data from the sensor. Or there could be a fault in the, the software driver, which is controlling this benefit. And thus, that is the reason for giving uh, you know, wrong data further for processing. So actually, the, 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 what is covered in the scope of the safe acquisition is till where the data <clears throat> is acquired and given it further to the application. So all the faults ultimately have an impact and uh, you know have basically the same impact ultimately that it provides the wrong data further on which we you know we are doing our computation which could ultimately produce the wrong results which could be as it is and could cause accidents now different solutions can be taken uh, so the example there here i am providing now consider one of the sensor that i am talking about is faulty. So what we can do, we can have the redundancy, we can have two sensors uh, having the, you know, the, the same inputs. So if I have to calculate the speed uh, of the car, so it comes to me through, to, through different, two different sensors. OK, and now if it is coming through the two different sensors, uh, at least if one sensor is faulty, uh, I will get to know because uh, then the other sensor will give me different input, right? The, the uh, two sensors uh, will produce different uh, inputs to the to the silicon if uh, one is faulty. Similarly, if uh, there is a problem in the, the connection from the sensor to the silicon, again, you know, I will get different inputs. So I will be able to detect that the, you know, there is a problem. With the input. Now here again, I give it to my different uh, channels or I could give it to different peripherals. So basically within the silicon also, I'm using a different path uh, to be able to get the input from uh, different sensors. So basically I'm taking this redundant path to calculate the car speed. If input here to the sensor is car speed, but ultimately the speed of the car is same at any particular time. Right. So if my car is running at 100 km per hour, ultimately, if I'm calculating the speed, I should get 100 km per hour. But if the input that is coming via this path and this path is different, that means there is some problem. So by bringing in this redundancy, you know, I am able to get to know that there is a problem. So that is what I mean by the, the safe acquisition. Did we prevent the wrong acquisition here by having this kind of architecture? 
So th this is the kind of things that we can have in the safety architecture. We can mention in the safety architecture and what we can do is that in the silicon, you know, we can enable such kind of architecture on the, uh, the users of the silicon cell. You know, we, we want to make sure that we provide the support, but uh, majority of the things uh, here actually come in the uh, the scope of the users of silicon, which ensures that uh, we are preventing the wrong acquisition of data. So like that, the, the safety concept of silicon, when it is done, it is able to give the assumptions uh, on the way the silicon is to be used uh, to make sure that uh, you know the input that is coming to the the, the silicon the the acquisition that the data acquisition that the silicon is doing we don't have a fault in that okay And when we do such uh, uh, propose such methods, right? Uh, we also have this. Uh, uh, we do the FMEDA for the silicon, and uh, proposing such different methods and having such things in our, uh, you know, considered in our architecture or these assumptions, we say that you know these faults would get detected. We are going to prevent the wrong acquisition, and all such mechanisms which are uh, you know which are suggested provide us with some coverage numbers and with which we claim that you know i this is the number that i got based on this mechanism and uh, so overall in the silicon when i am we are following some standards we are expected to have the coverage against uh, uh, any any faults, right? So I have, I'm supposed to have a diagnostic coverage. So all such mechanisms add to my coverage numbers, which will help me, uh, you know, uh, claim that uh, I am covering against uh, detection of any faults, right? So hence my silicon is safe. So all these things would add up, and uh, we would be able to present a coverage numbers that is required for us to be. Uh, safety uh, following the uh, any particular safety integrity levels okay safe computation uh, so uh, i think this is something uh, that you would have seen uh, in the previous uh, session also and i'll just quickly have a, a go over that topic again uh, on the log step uh, so uh, you know for the safe compute the most commonly used mechanism is log step so what is meant by log step uh, is that you know you have a main core and then you have a, a shadow core or you have a uh, a locked code uh, so if you are doing a computation on the main core the same computation also gets repeated or duplicated on the, the locked code. So if you are doing say three plus two, we are doing an addition. So your main code it produces the result of three plus two, five, then, then your locked code, shadow code is also supposed to give the same result, three plus two, five. Okay, and so in the lock step, then if the, the, the same result should be produced by both the entities, and if the same result is not produced by both the entities, that means you know that there is a problem in your Cool. So you, because you, we don't know what is the output result, it should be, but we we don't we do know that for the same input the output has to be same, and if it does not match, that means there is a problem. So this is typically a mechanism. It is called log step. Okay, so you have main core and the shadow core, and everything gets uh, executed both on the main and the the shadow. So this is a hardware based safety mechanism that we duplicate the code. Now, in addition to this, there are, you know, there are a lot of focus on more innovative software based method methods uh, for the safety in compute and, uh, uh, you know, avoiding lockstep. 
so industry has not been really very successful to uh, claim the same amount of coverage uh, that we get from lockstep but uh, you know things are coming uh, one is the software based self test library which is uh, you know again very common uh, but it has its own uh, issues uh, here uh, you know you basically can run the tests of core uh, and they are run periodically during the runtime and if there is a fault, if there is a permanent fault in the core, it will get uh, uh, detected. But it does not provide the same uh, level of uh, fault detection coverage as Logstep. It can be used, but it can be used for the uh, less integrity, safety integrity level. So it does not provide the same coverage. Other methods are like software based Logstep. So here the, the philosophy is basically same as lockstep because uh, you know here also you do a uh, sort of duplication uh, so the same thing is executed twice but then here uh, there is a selective duplication that is possible right because in the hardware lockstep the selective duplication is not possible you are basically having two ports you know which is hardwired Whatever is executed on the main core, it is also executed on the uh, the locked core. But when it is software, right? You know what you want to run, uh, you know which needs to be duplicated. So you can selectively run on some safety critical, some safety critical part of it. Uh, you can duplicate. So this is called software lockstep. Uh, but then uh, you know it it has its own challenges. But software lockstep is an, another uh, approach that is, uh, you know, being. Uh, uh, it's becoming uh, sort of uh, possible or popular, at least in the industrial application. It's still not, uh, you know, it's not able to provide the kind of coverage for SLD uh, yet, but. Uh, and also there is a lot of challenges and overheads on the applications. Uh, you know, on identifying on what should be in the scope of duplication, uh, then checking the result of the duplicate execution uh, from an independent software entity, and then making sure that uh, there is no common cause of the failure uh, on, you know, the one which is checking the results to the one which is, uh, you know, uh, producing the results and uh, you know on the on the duplication also so uh, it comes with its challenges but uh, then that is what the the software safety architecture would have to uh, enable or make sure so uh, but then uh, on a simple application these are the things which are possible and these are the things which are being done uh, to you know use other mechanisms other than long step the hardware lock stepping uh, to provide the as a safety mechanism for the safe company. Next is the, the safe interconnect. Uh, so here when the software is running on the silicon on its core, so it accesses the data through memory the core is accessing the data and that also happens through the interconnect. Uh, so there are multiple paths in the silicon that come uh, in the safety related control and data flow. Uh, so, you know, you, you have memory, memory to core accesses, you have, you know, the, the peripherals. And if we do not have the mechanisms put to the on the data, which is uh, traveling over the interconnect, then it can get corrupted. So, so then we are working on the uh, the corrupt corrupt data. So then, uh, what is it that uh, you know would would be done, uh, or the how the safety would be guaranteed, or you know the the faults in the interconnect would get covered. Uh, so when when we when we develop the silicon, the, the control and data flow is analyzed. You know, different parts of the silicons would be may, will be uh, modeled and what is the data flow and the control flow between those parts that would be modeled. 
OK, and then it would be seen that what makes sense uh, from this to this, say if there is a control or data flow and uh, you know, I do not want the corruption to happen. I do not want any other mechanism, uh, you know, where the application has to take care of anything. Uh, then I will provide the, you know, some safety mechanisms uh, in the hardware itself. Right, there could be parity, there could be ECC, such mechanisms could be given in the hardware and then, you know, uh, it's all safe. I can say that nothing, no corruption would happen uh, in, in your flow of data. In other cases, I can think that, yeah, the corruption could happen. I know that the corruption could happen, so I can have some, uh, some something uh, in the software that can make sure that it detects the corruption. So, uh, or another thing could be that, uh, yeah, uh, there could be a corruption, but then it's OK. It, it doesn't come in my safety related path. So I do not uh, uh, really worry about the corruption because it does not come. It does not affect the, my safety concept. So in in the in such cases, then again, uh, you know, that part of the interconnect can be considered non safety related and uh, we do not bring any safety mechanisms in that part. So the, these are the things which are analyzed and that is that is what is basically the safety architecture, right? So I need to give something or I do not need to give something. If I need to give something, how which is the most appropriate way that uh, uh, how I should implement that I should implement it in the hardware or I should implement it in the software. So these are all the things which are uh, uh, taken care and accordingly the, the mechanisms are uh, architected in the appropriate uh, life cycle. So next is the safe uh, communication. Uh, so the communication outside the SOC happens through the cables and wires external to the chip. So you see here, <clears throat> this is SOC 1, this is SOC 2. Now this could be there in the different uh, ECUs. So if you see typically in the car, uh, the, the communication could take place through the CAN, which is a very popular uh, communication protocol for automotive. It could take place through the, the Ethernet. Uh, so uh, this communication channel, we can consider it as a black channel. So when I say black channel, it means that, uh, you know, this channel could corrupt the data. It's not protected. Uh, whereas if I say white channel, that means the channel itself is protected. It will not corrupt the data. OK, so if the white channel does not corrupt the data, then I do not need to think about, you know, the corruption of the data flowing between the these two entities. But if there is a channel in between which could corrupt the data. Then it requires, you know, it puts the, these requirements on this side and this side. That is the sender and receiver. Uh, to, uh, to make sure that, you know, the if if the black channel corrupted the data, how is it that the receiver will get to know about it? Because, you know, you have to first get to know about it, that the corruption has taken place then only you can do something, right? So for that, you have to, you know, put in additional fields, which will be able to tell you that the corruption has taken place. So this is what we consider in the safety concept for safe communication, that the sender sends something additional, sender includes uh, in the, the data, or along with the, the data, that is the payload, some additional fields uh, which will be able to tell the receiver that, you know, uh, the, the data that you are getting is intact or uh, it is not the data that you should consume. There is some, some problem in the data. So sender site, uh, if it is successfully able to, uh, you know, detect that uh, you know, there is a problem in the data, then there can be various ways it can be handled. It can ignore the data. It can ask for a retransmit. 
it does not send back the acknowledgement of the data through which sender gets to know that you know uh, uh, there is a problem so th this this is a communication protocol that can be you know there between the sender and the receiver so which will make sure that uh, you know my communication is working uh, smoothly so this is typically the, the safety concept that is taken care uh, that is uh, you know made for the safe communication and there are there are lots of uh, other things which come on the way uh, but the basic concept is that you bring all the different entities on the center side and on the receiver side you bring make it part of the black channel or you make it part of the white channel or you know high outside the scope of black channel so if the black channel is ending somewhere you know where exactly it is ending because till the time it is in the scope of black channel you can always think that it could corrupt now that the scope of black channel could be just the hardware or the scope of black channel should could be also the software you know there is a protocol stack which is typically there and uh, if your protocol stack is also you know can be faulty it could corrupt the data so then the scope of black channel will keep expanding expanding and it will go beyond the hardware the cables and wires external to the chip to the peripherals that you have which is acquiring which is uh, which is getting the data uh, like you know the CAN protocol the, the layers of the protocol stack, the software stack, the middleware, everything could be there in the black channel. Is a question? Okay, so everything could be there as part of the black channel. And uh, then uh, as you move from black channel to the white channel, that is where you start, uh, you know, uh, extracting these fields like checksum, frame counter, sender receiver IDs, and then you find out you know, it could get corrupted wherever in the software layers or in the hardware. Uh, so that is how this concept can be put very simply. But then there are many entities which could be there, uh, which could corrupt the data. So we have to put the those different uh, hardware and software entities accordingly uh, as part of the black channel or as part of the white channel. Like, you know, this I will make safety related and so I will put it in the white channel. This I will not keep safety related, so I will consider it as part of black channel. So there's a lot of things which happen uh, uh, for this concept very simply put here. OK. Safe infrastructure. Uh, so voltage and clock. These are the basic infrastructure that the SOC needs to work. Uh, so the safe functioning of these are provided by the by the hardware using clocks and voltage monitors. So you consider that there is a voltage source. You know it provides the supply voltage. And then there could also be the voltage monitors, which monitors that supply voltage. OK, so this voltage monitor ensures so voltage monitor is the safety mechanism, which ensures that the supply is good enough. There is no fault in the supply. Uh, <clears throat> similarly, there are clock monitors. Now th there are clock sources right in the in the SOC. Uh, there are different things which works on different clock. So uh, if you if it is one main clock, clock source, it goes through multiple dividers because you know something in the silicon works at some clock, something works at uh, you know reduced clock. So there are there is a clock network in the silicon, right? So the dividers, dividers, dividers. So at the leaf, somebody some some IP in the silicon is working. So so then effectively there are multiple clocks basically, which are driving the different parts of the silicon. So you can consider these are the different clocks coming, right? And then these are the different clocks being taken, given and the, as the input to the different clock monitors. There are different monitors. 
So with these clock monitors again are the, the safety mechanisms for the for the clock. So this these two here are shown as the hardware safety mechanisms. So additionally, the concept always also uses the uh, something external to the, the silicon, which monitors the SOC. So this is the external watchdog. OK, now there are many dependent failures, right, uh, which could happen. And we do not always consider uh, the safety mechanisms within the sil silicon enough, right? So we provide uh, this additional assumption that uh, you know the there should be an external watchdog which should be monitoring my silicon. Okay, I will service it periodically from time to time. Um, and if I don't service it then uh, this external watchdog should you know uh, take the system to a safe state considering that my silicon is faulty because i am not able to service it as i should have serviced it so now this external safety mechanism also takes care of a uh, fault in the voltage or or in the clock or also if the software misbehaves if there are some systematic issues in the software, right, that uh, there's a bug in the software. Uh, so in case of such misbehaviors by the software, uh, by some bugs in the software, that also gets detected. So this is again a more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, protocol that we have, uh, where which we typically use uh, for uh, serving the external watchdog. These are more sophisticated watchdogs, which are, you know, just not, uh, they don't detect only the, the delayed response, like, you know, watchdog is just watching that I should be serviced periodically uh, within this time. But it also detect, detects that early servicing, you know, it's a windowed watchdog, so I should be serviced in this window. So both early and delayed uh, thing gets executed. And you know they are intelligent watchdogs. Uh, they expect uh, you know uh, to be serviced with some values, right? And if you service the watchdog with a wrong value at wrong time, everything gets detected. So uh, through this, you can uh, monitor the program flow of your software. So the program flow of the software when you start uh, you know detecting uh, a change. So you have to first have a statically defined program flow, very static, because whatever you are sending uh, to the watchdog and you have defined it statically, basically you program your watchdog that this would be uh, the value with which the silicon is going to service. So basically then you have to define that static flow. And if you are servicing the watchdog with a different uh, program flow value, that means it is going to give the uh, uh, you know, consider silicon as faulty. So then such things are able to detect, such mechanisms are able to detect a, a wide range of failures in the, uh, on the silicon side. So if your voltage is faulty, it could affect your uh, program flow or it would affect the, the way you are going to service your watchdog you know, early or delayed. Similarly, even if your clock is faulty, again, it will affect your uh, program flow. If there is a problem in your software and the software is misbehaving, and if you have modeled that, you have factored in the, this misbehavior, uh, you know, to be reflected in your pro uh, program flow, then this also will give the different value to the external watchdog and it will service the watchdog with a wrong value. And that's how the watchdog will be able to detect it. So uh, the such intelligent uh, program flow monitoring with such external watchdogs is a mechanism which gives you coverage uh, for variety of things. OK, so that's why this is also a very common uh, additional safety mechanism which uh, you know the silicon vendors always consider in addition to all other safety mechanisms that we give, because it gives the coverage against various other parts. Uh, now, another very important topic is uh, criteria for coexistence. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is very important for the software. Uh, 
because typically uh, you know the as we move from the small microcontrollers to more and more uh, complex uh, uh, silicons, you know, having multi core, so many cores, uh, heterogeneous cores, and uh, so typically how it happens is if if in the old platforms of the of the cars, I use one MCU for uh, one application. So I have hundreds of uh, MCUs for running different different applications and the overall architecture of the of the you know the vehicle platform gets very uh, complicated, right? So they have to have multiple uh, small ECUs and each ECU is responsible for running some application. So now, uh, you know, we all the semiconductor vendors are coming with more and more powerful silicons, you know, a lot of compute possible. So on a single piece of silicon. So that means what, you know, the, the customers in their vehicle uh, platform, vehicle architecture also, you know, converge on running many applications on a single piece of silicon, right? So when they run many applications, that means that, uh, you know, some of it is safety related, you know, very, very safety critical, like uh, your braking system, uh, your uh, ADAS, advanced driver assistance systems, something that caters to you know, autonomous driving, the driverless cars. And at the same time, something which is uh, not that much safety related, like, you know, your uh, power windows, your sunroof system, uh, and such things to something which is uh, not at all safety relevant, uh, like your uh, infotainment systems. And all. Okay, so now if if there were different MCUs taking care, running different such applications, then you know the criteria of, for coexistence is really not so critical because you know everything is running separately. It is it is just separate by the very nature of it. The way the overall vehicle platform is, but consider when all these things have to run on a single piece of silicon. I have uh, some ten cores on the single uh, silicon that I'm providing. So then multiple applications are running all together in from a single piece of silicon. So that is when the the criteria for coexistence becomes very very you know critical. So that is where uh, you know the semiconductor vendors have to provide the mechanisms that we are able to make partitions while we are on the single. So, so suppose application one, application two, application three, you know, three applications are running and there is a single resource pool. So I cannot have this monolithic kind of uh, uh, architecture that it is a resource pool, anybody uses anything. You know, because uh, then uh, if one application uses it, other and other was also using it, it gets changed, updated, corrupted, whatever. You know, it, it affects my resources. I cannot trust it, right? I am a separate application. So that is where the silicon vendors, they have to give the mechanisms of partitioning, right? So now this is my application. This is my resource set. Nobody is able to probably even see it. Right, I can have such uh, mechanisms that you know my resources are my private. Nobody can even see it. Similarly, application two has its own resources. So these red lines are showing that something which should be prevented. The application one should not be able to uh, use or see or at least write into my resources. So it just depends on now, uh, you know, what are the kind of constraints or limitations we want to put. We want to let it read. Or, uh, but not write, or we do not even want to, you know, let it read. So, you know, both the mechanisms, such mechanisms are have to be provided. Where we, we say we can, we are okay to read, for the other to read, or we are not okay for the other to even see my data, it's completely private. So, uh, this kind of uh, mechanisms are supposed to be there, and, uh, you know, this asks for the requirements in the hardware to be able to partition, but at the same time, the software has to be written in such a way that, you know, first that it uh, configures the hardware to, to make such partitions because partitions ultimately are made by the software. 
hardware provides an infrastructure. Okay, and then uh, you know, architect your software in such a way that uh, you know you you work in a you are uh, you are working as a small entity and small encapsulated complete entity. You do not you know do not try to access somebody else's resources. So the whole whole architecture has to be like this because you know the once you you use these hardware mechanisms that uh, you cannot see its resource or access its resource, but then you have to design your software like this because if you access then you will get violations. Okay, so safety is taken care, but then if you get violations, of course you cannot execute. So the the the, the, the application will not function. So that is how the, the software has to be, you know, designed in such a way to, to work in line with this uh, kind of coexistence that, you know, you are coexisting with somebody else here and you are not supposed to interfere and you are supposed to use uh, the things in your partition, the resources that belong to you. Uh, so if I put this more in the, the way uh, typically, uh, you know, uh, in the scope of the operating system, the VMs, VMMM, hypervisor. So uh, this is the way it, the demonstration of isolation can be done. Uh, suppose I have only one uh, safe VM. So if I have two applications running on this VM, then it is the, the operating system which will provide the isolation. OK, in case the safety and non safety workloads are running on different OS, then you know this whole is my safe VM and you know the, maybe the rest of the VMs are non safe VM. Then I have to do the partitioning this way, right? So the VMM will provide the required isolation. But then uh, you know Sometimes there are some resources which uh, the safe VM and the non safe VM both have to use. Right, so that is where some um, ownership is provided uh, and you know we can have the core to core communication mechanisms uh, or the, the mediation via the hypervisor that some resource which is a common resource, you know, and who can use it. Uh, both have to use it. Right. But uh, it would be under ownership of one. Uh, it could be under the ownership of uh, the VMM, and every access then goes via the VMM. Or it could be under the ownership of maybe the service VM, and uh, you know this always requests the service VM to do it. So uh, you know such partitioning, some uh, such architecture uh, is defined on what is the resource. Who has to use it? Who has to predominantly use it? And then, and then, if the resources uh, that particular entity who has to predominantly use that resource is made the master of that resource, owner of that resource, and the others always go and request that entity. So this is the system architecture, which uh, you know has to be there to to be able to uh, you know. Uh, ensure the freedom from interference and of course they always use some underlying hardware safety mechanisms um, to to be you know to ensure that uh, we are doing what it what it takes uh, lastly uh, i'll talk about the safety management uh, so this is a slide from uh, the standards uh, ISO 26262 is the functional safety standards uh, for the automotive and uh, there are different parts for these standards, right? you know, the, the safety management, then the product uh, development at the system level where we do the functional safety concepts. So the safety management is the part two, uh, product development at the system level. Here we, we define the, the safety concept right and the part five and the part six are the the hardware uh, development and the software development respectively okay then you know there are the supporting processes uh, the safety analysis and rest of the things so 
you know, this, this, these are things very, very important. And along with that, the safety management, because the safety management, uh, you know, overall defines that. How is it that your work products have to be developed? You know, what will be your, your life cycle? Uh, which are the different uh, safety work products you will do? Uh, you know, what are all the things which uh, are mandatory uh, as per the you know the standards into a work product? So all those things uh, will be defined by your uh, uh, during during your safety management. Okay, so uh, the standards allow us to do the the tailoring. Uh, you have to be able to justify whatever tailoring you do. So if the standards ask us to produce certain work products uh, and, uh, you know, because standards are you know very standard, it is not made for your custom. Uh, what do you say development? So if you are able to tailor out something that I don't do this and then you justify why you don't do this. So, and if this justification is reasonable, then, you know, based on that, you can tailor out whatever is something that you don't do as part of the process. Okay, so I'm just highlighting different parts, uh, which is uh, as per ISO 26262, which is defined. So if you go through the standards, uh, in the first part, it would be the, the vocabulary. Uh, then, uh, Second is safety management, as I as I mentioned. The third is the concept phase. So here, this is typically done by the OEMs, you know, uh, the automotive manufacturer. Uh, so that is where the item definition is done. So they do the HARA, which is uh, hazard analysis and risk assessment. From there, <clears throat> they define the safety goals, which act as the top level safety requirements. And the functional safety concept is uh, made. So these are the top level safety. This, this is the functional safety concept for uh, your uh, uh, for the item level, basically. The, what are the use cases? And based on that safety uh, application, you will come out come out with the hazard. So that's why it is done at the OEM level. Then, uh, you know, uh, is the where the tire ones come. come. Uh, they do the technical safety concept, technical safety architecture, uh, the SM classification of the function, and then they give the requirement to the hardware and the software design. OK. Uh, so then the, you know, the basically, uh, this is what where the semiconductor uh, companies come. And uh, the the products that they give get mapped to the safety requirements that are coming from the tire ones and OEMs. They they are getting mapped to uh, here. So if if a semiconductor company gives a you know silicon for open market, right, which can be used for different applications. So basically, you know whatever is coming from here and whatever is coming from here, you know. Uh, top down and bottom up. So this mapping is actually uh, done that, you know, whatever I need is getting fulfilled by this or not. So once this mapping is done and, uh, you know, the all the requirements that I had uh, are getting fulfilled, that is how they can choose uh, to go with a particular silicon. So that is where this decision would, can be made that, you know, yeah, I can buy silicon for so and so company for my you know so and so vehicle platform okay and uh, then uh, when the uh, the production operation service and decommissioning so these are the things when you know are coming when the ecu manufacturing manufacturing is taking place and then they are installed in the in the vehicle uh, so these are all the things which are coming from the, the safety standards. ISO 26262 is the, the safety standards which are followed by you know, uh, for the automotive. And all the things uh, are ensured by the quality process. You know, the, the life cycle is followed and uh, the life cycle uh, to the safety, the, the audits and all the quality audits will be able to make sure that, uh, you know, the Everything is as per the 
the organization's uh, quality uh, within the uh, uh, organization's quality checklist. So now, if, if you see hardware and the software, so uh, both the things are, you know, what we call is SCOOC, safety element out of context. So the hardware component is developed as one SCOOC and the software components could be developed as uh, another SCOOC. So the reason we are calling it safety element out of context is because, you know, uh, the OEM is doing their safety analysis and coming up with the, the safety goals, then tire ones are, you know, uh, going ECU wise and uh, giving the requirements to the hardware and software. But the semiconductor vendors are making their, uh, you know, they are developing their silicon uh, totally out of context of this. So, so uh, we, we make our silicons and then some semiconductor companies after that decide that, uh, you know, we could use this. So the development of silicon is happening out of context. They consider the use cases. They consider how it could be used to be able to, uh, you know, give the mechanisms, underlying mechanisms to make sure that, you know, when the, when the, the OEMs or tier one companies are trying to map their safety requirements, they will be able to fulfill it through our silicon. But I am not, uh, uh, you know, I am not developing my silicon in the context of uh, those ECUs. They could be used, they could be developed out of context, but they could be found relevant and they could, uh, they could integrate my silicon. So the whole development starts with some assumptions how it would get integrated. So that is where the the whole life cycle is uh, you know started with the assumptions how the silicon would be used and uh, based on that the safety uh, requirements are uh, you know uh, are, are, are initiated that's why it is called the safety element out of context and when the safety element out of context is done then it also comes up with the assumptions that uh, you know uh, it puts on software uh, to uh, make sure that uh, you know when I my 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 safety concept is uh, complete uh, in itself, uh, even though I am not giving all the mechanisms in the hardware, I depend on many things on the software. So that is where you know I am expecting I am giving some requirements to the software. Uh, so if if the silicon vendors do not develop it by themselves, then they can put it in assumptions and some other software components which are again developed. Uh, as a COCs would be able to fulfill those requirements. So these are the two different life cycles, part five and part six, part five for hardware, part six for software. So uh, I briefly talk about safety uh, at NXP. Uh, so traditionally, uh, you know, NXP is a semiconductor company, so it basically uh, is into the silicon, right? In, in the silicon definition, supplying the the silicon, and uh, is focused on the the safety aspects implementation in the hardware. Uh, but then, uh, you know, to when we do the safety concept, uh, we do a combined hardware and software safety concept. So that we ensure that uh, you know whatever we expect from the software, those kind of requirements or the assumptions are also put in uh, put in place, uh, and we are considering this in our overall uh, safety concept. So even even though we give, uh, we are basically into the uh, into the hardware. Uh, we sell our hardware, but then the, our safety concepts are uh, hardware plus software. And, uh, you know, we do the realization of the safety concept also. So there's a software that, uh, you know, is also uh, the requirements of for the software, which are uh, which would realize the safety concept. We develop that software. 
and uh, you know support customers with that software. Some of the software is actually the software that uh, you know the, the customers would buy, and some of the software is something that you know just to show the realization of the safety concept gets uh, done as a reference or the demo software by an expert. So uh, we are completely involved in the realization of the safety concept through the hardware and the software. So, you know, this needs a lot of efforts on the software side. Uh, so some of it production software and some of it the software solutions that we give, uh, you know, to, to realize the, the safety concept. OK, so. Uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I will just give a, a you know overall conclusion on what say functional safety is and uh, what is the purpose. What is it that I was trying to to explain and uh, uh, how is it that you can learn more about functional safety? So basically, it is a branch of engineering that deals with controlling and detecting failures from the system, and the purpose is to uh, control the you know injury or death because of the accidents. So uh, that is why we have to either detect the faults or control the faults. Uh, and that, that is that is why the functional safety standards. So this is this is the branch of the engineering which talks about uh, you know both the architecture, uh, the, the processes that have to be put in the place uh, to, to just enable the functional safety in the product. So, and it is a it is actually a branch of engineering which uh, deals with the, both the things to to have the control the systematic uh, failures which are done by the process and also by the you know, having the proper safety mechanisms in place which is done by the safety architecture. Uh, so, various safety uh, systems are based on industry practices as and uh, they are defined in the, the safety standards as I mentioned for the automotive motive it is ISO 26262 for which I had uh, you know shown you the uh, the slide from the standards and uh, for the industrial it is IEC 61508 uh, so you know there are there are industry practices which are used very well defined in the standards so you know we can we can see what is what gets implemented and then mapping to the to the standards. So it's a in in some cases it is just one to one mapping on you know the soft the standards suggest so and so things, and if we implement uh, so and so mechanism, this is the this is the sort of coverage that we will get, and that is how then we could bring in those measures into the architecture. So again, this would be uh, this would be the the work of uh, you know uh, in the functional safety branch that you you would learn. Uh, so automotive safety based on ISO 26262 covers the entire life cycle of automotive development, as I showed you in the previous slide. So it it talks about uh, starting from the the safety management to the system level, you know, part two safety management to the system level, part three, part four, and then part five and part six hardware and software. And then, you know, some supporting processes like the change management, configuration management, and, and the safety analysis, and then the commissioning and all, all, all such things. So basically it covers the entire life cycle of the automotive. It covers the failures to random as well as uh, systematic. And these are both the things that have to be considered in designing a safe, safe system. So for the systematic, it is the processes which have to be taken care of, and for the random, again, it is safety architecture that has to be defined. Uh, so now uh, NXP has a very mature BCAM 7 processes. Uh, which puts the various processes, procedures, rules and responsibilities, everything in place uh, and it ensures the compliance to ISO 26262. So uh, again, when the standards are defined, right, they are more generic. So to apply those standards into the specific work, right, in which you are uh, involved, uh, like uh, 
you know, we have OEMs and we have tire one and then we have semiconductor vendors. So for which which part is uh, would apply, then taking out that and uh, you know tailoring it for what applies on the the rules that I have in my uh, in my scope. So BCAM seven is the process which defines all this. It puts the rules and responsibilities. Uh, uh, it defines the rules and responsibilities for the individuals in the in the organization. You know to fulfill the the to ensure the compliance. OK, so it is an evolving branch of engineering and you know the applications like uh, ADAS, automotive electrification, connectivity uh, with, the, with the growing electronics in the car. Uh, this branch is uh, becoming more and more uh, important and it is very evolving branch of engineering because you know the, the complexity in uh, the same the complexity in you know um, being autonomous, it gets keeps uh, getting increased. So we are talking about autonomous cars, the driverless vehicles. So uh, there is so much of electronics that car has to decide everything on its own. There is no driver, there is no human brain there to decide. So uh, it becomes so intelligent to replace a human mind. So that is where you know functional safety is becoming so important because whom to blame? when the wrong decisions are made. Similarly, even in the industrial applications, you know, more and more is being done by robotics and all that. So more of more automation is taking place. Again, the things are being done by, by you know, electronics there. And uh, again, who is to blame for some accidents and uh, the damage because of the accident? So now since everything is being done by by electronics and uh, you know by the, the that become the brain so we have to make sure that they don't misbehave and uh, the misbehavior does not cause a safety impact so safety functional safety is that branch which you know deals on if there is a misbehavior because you know you have developed a we have done a buggy design or because there is a fault in the hardware which uh, you know a random fault in the hardware which uh, this does not get uh, detected so this is a branch which uh, deals in this and uh, as of now there is a very limited education uh, in this field i, I don't think uh, you know there is uh, in academia there is a very limited exposure to this branch so that is where you know nxp really uh, uh, offers lots of uh, uh, courses and education as part of the safety academy. We have uh, some internal courses. Uh, so these are the courses which uh, we we can offer because uh, there is very less, which is uh, you know le very less exposure into this uh, branch. And uh, I think uh, yeah, academia can uh, get in touch with NXP for uh, you know getting access to such courses. <laughs> 